And in agriculture, like the Christmas trees I showed you on the slides, or the, um, the moisture gradient I showed you at the end of the last segment, a lot of people see a randomized complete block design as a grid on paper or a grid in the field. And you can lay it out as a grid, but it doesn't have to be. And I think this is a great example of an agricultural experiment that's looking at extraction of sulfur for industrial and agricultural use from five different soils in Florida. So how do you get sulfur? You strip mine the soils from a given area and you run them through an extraction process and you put what's left back where it was and you have uh, an environmental disaster left behind. Um, I won't get into that, but sulfur mining is pretty harsh to the environment. You literally strip mine an entire area and you take hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of acres and you just strip everything off of it, run it through a processing facility to pull out the sulfur. And so how do they pull out the sulfur? There are different chemicals that you can use. And so they're looking at four chemicals and actually three chemicals plus the control water, just straight water. They're looking at calcium chloride, ammonium acetate, and monocalcium phosphate, and comparing those to water. And they're looking at how well do each of these four possible treatments the chemicals they're using to get the sulfur, how well do each of these use or work to get sulfur in five different soils in various mining areas of Florida? So the main interest in the experiment is the comparison of four extraction methods. We're interested in water versus the three chemicals. The variation imposed on the extraction procedure by the five different soil types represents a source of extraneous variation. If I know that I have five very different types of soil, would I think that there might be very big differences in how efficient each of these extraction chemicals might be in the different soils? And the answer is, yeah, it, could, it might be. We don't know for sure. Maybe every single time there's always a winner and it's always the same, but maybe sometimes the soil presents so much variation that we can't tell what's going on. So the different soil types need to be kept separate in our experiment. We need to control for the variation imposed on our experimental data by keeping the soils separate. Um, there's a high probability of concluding that there is no treatment effects when uh, treatment effects are in fact present. In other words, if I stick all the soil data into one big pile without blocking my data, it might just look like a bunch of noise and we might say it doesn't matter, take your pick, water, calcium chloride, it doesn't matter. Any one of them is about as good as the other. It's just a bunch of noise. The only way that we can make fair comparisons to keep the experiment properly organized or blocked in this case is keeping the soils separate. So let's look at the actual data uh, pulled off without any numbers, but here are the soil types that are listed, all the five soil types. And with calcium chloride, we have these data points. With um, uh, ammonium acetate, we have these extraction levels of um, sulfur. And with uh, monocalcium phosphate, we have these extraction levels. And there's a huge amount of overlap. They all have some high values and some low values. The only one that kind of stands out a little bit as being uh, not on average as good as the other three is water. But even water beats some of the other chemicals in some of the measurements. So if I look at this, it's like, I, I can't see anything. 
just a bunch of noise. I don't know which chemical is better. But if we group these data by blocking them by soil type, the information becomes quite obvious. So now we have the soils grouped by block. So block number three is the Leon soil. And you'll notice with the Leon soil, what's the winner? Ammonium acetate. In that block, ammonium acetate wins. What about with the Chipley soil? Well, ammonium acetate wins. What about with the Lakeland soil? Ammonium acetate wins. What about with the Troop soil? Ammonium acetate wins. And in the uh, Norfolk soil, uh, ammonium acetate and calcium chloride are very, very, very close. But if you look closely at that line, ammonium acetate still wins by a little bit. That is an upward sloping line by just a tiny bit. So it clearly is telling me when we block them just visually, I can say ammonium acetate's the winner. Now, most experiments, you don't come to a conclusion looking at a graph that's not appropriate. This, this is something that is very visually uh, easy to understand for illustration purposes. The only way to really know for sure if the ammonium acetate is truly the best is you have to run the math. You got to do the statistical analysis or analysis of variance, ANOVA. And I'm, I can tell you looking at these results, uh, unless there's huge amounts of experimental error that we can't see in this graph, the ammonium acetate's going to be the winner. Usually you don't see things that obvious from a graph of this type. But that's why it's important. This graph, I don't know what the hell's going on. This graph, I can tell right away because this graph is organized by the blocks. So the pattern of responses to treatments is consistent within a given soil type or block, but responses vary across soil types. Clearly, if you wanna maximize your, your yield of uh, sulfur, uh, Leon soils, the better soil, but you can't always go to Leon soil. You gotta go where you can, where you can mine. You gotta go where the, the soil is, uh, but preferentially, you'll choose the Leon soil certainly over Norfolk or, uh, or Troop. So what are the blocks? I've already talked about that enough. Uh, I do it a little different in class. The five soil types are the blocks. So randomized complete block design. There are rules for blocking. You wanna carefully examine the situation and identify those factors which are known to affect the proposed response. So you might have a change in soil type that you know of in a given air area where you're going to run an experiment. If there's more than one soil type, that's a perfect thing to block against. There might be shadows caused by trees growing near your field. And those shadows are going to move across your, your production field from uh, west to east, right? As the sun comes up in the east and it, it casts a shadow on your entire field maybe if the, if the trees are on the east and as the sun is coming up, it's coming up over those trees and the shadow is moving back in the opposite direction of the movement of the sun. Again, that's something you could block against. Um, there might be a history of the block that you need to know about. Always ask about the history of a given field. Now, when I say block, I'm talking about a planting block or an irrigation unit. Um, I'm not talking about a randomized complete block block. I'm talking about a planting block. So if I'm out there in the field and I have a particular field that has something going on with it, and I know right down the middle, this half of the field was planted in baby leaf spinach and this half was planted in broccoli um, the last time something was there, I've got a, a split in the middle. My ideal situation is avoid the split. If I can't avoid the split, I'm going to consider the broccoli side versus the 
baby leaf spinach side to be two different blocks because there's going to be different residual organic material based on the crop that was last grown in that part of the field. And a lot of people forget to look for that. I went to a field and, oh, no, there's no difference. Everything's the same here. And I always go out to a field when I'm going to run an experiment. One of my rituals is to go out to the field uh, first thing in the morning before sunrise. So I'm there having my first cup of coffee as I'm getting organized as the sun's cracking over the hill. And I look at the field as the sun is rising. I walk out through the area. I kind of get the feel. And there are certain things that you can only see at sunrise when the sun's really low skimming across the field. And I look in the field, I go to the edge of the field, I'm looking around, how do I wanna lay this out? And I looked at this one field and I'm like, something's weird. I've never seen anything quite like this. It looked almost like there was this faint checkerboard pattern and, and checkerboards were like bedroom size checks in this field. And I'm like, why does it look like there are these bedroom size chunks in the field? And I went back to the growers. Oh, yeah, two years ago, we ran a cover crop trial here. And I could still, two years later, and multiple diskings later, I could still see the remnants of that cover crop trial. And so I just talked to him and said, Let, can we go to the block or the field next door uh, to avoid that trial and how it might impact our, our trial now. And oh, sure, no problem. We went to another field, but I would not have seen that had I not gone out early in the morning and just caught these subtle differences with the way that the morning light plays as it skims across the field. Anyway, you generally want to choose one factor. And if you have two factors, hopefully they run parallel to each other. If you have two factors running perpendicular to each other, you need a good statistician. Um, or just go to another field if you can. Blocking factors are sometimes called disturbing factors. Disturbing factors are those experimental things you're trying to avoid. Those, excuse me, those environmental variances that you're trying to avoid. Moisture gradients, slopes, sun exposure, shadows from trees nearby. Um, soil type differences, et cetera. All of those things are called blocking factors or disturbing factors. And yeah, I know in grad school, I call them disturbing factors for another reason. Um, but I, I don't know outside of class that I've ever heard anybody use the term disturbing factors. They're, it's always blocking factors, at least in the ag industry. Um, so here are some examples of typical blocking factors, uh, nutrient gradients and soil moisture gradients, slope differences, soil composition. We talked about all these except the nutrient gradient. Sometimes you have a nutrient gradient in the field where you, you have uh, one nutrient that changes across the field. And so you would have a field plot experiment out in that field. Orientation to the sun, flow of air, dis distribution of heat are disturbing variables you might find in a greenhouse. Uh, greenhouses are supposed to be totally uniform. They're not. They never are. You're closer to the cooling pads. You're further away. You're along the north wall, the south wall. You're near the door, away from the door. You're near the vents. You're away from the vents. I mean, there's so many things that are different. Greenhouses are not as uniform as you think they are. Um, if you're doing trees in an orchard or vines in a vineyard, the age of the vines or trees, the local density. So if I've got a uh, tree or vines that are five and a half foot apart versus six foot apart. Um, again, that would be a known source of variation. Uh, trellis design, you know, you've got a VSP uh, irrigation unit, and right next to it, you have a liar trellised irrigation unit with the same variety. Well, those are two different blocks experimentally because there are going to be differences between VSP and liar. In a human trial, you have gender, age, sociodemographics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, lots of things 
human experiments are really challenging. So I'm going to take one last break. <laughs>